I'm, sh I'm sure most people in the room remember that a couple of years ago, uh, the NYA, working with the All Party Parliamentary Group from Youth Affairs, published uh, what I would call a landmark report around youth work. It was the first policy report for about eight years, driven by 60 or so MPs talking about youth work and the key challenges that young people face. There is no doubt in my mind that report kick-started political conversations, support. We, you know, the first version of that called for a statutory guidance to be reviewed. It's underway. It called for workforce investment. There's some, you know, there's, there's been some real benefits and, and some moved on. There are other things we call for a min dedicated minister. Not quite got that far, but, we're, but it, there's things, but there's been conversations. Um, at two or three years on, two and a bit years on from that report, um, it felt right to uh, approach the APPG again uh, and say, could we revisit the, the recommendations? Could we open the doors to talk to organisations again, get young people back in the room, see what we think has changed, see where we're going next? Um, and I'm really pleased to be uh, supportive. So I'm going to introduce our panel. Um, and, and I know them well because I spent quite a lot of time. Um, but Joe Gideon is the is, uh, MP and chair of the APPG. So Joe, thank you for, for joining us. And uh, uh, Lloyd was the co-chair of APPG and uh, and uh, sort of shared that role with Joe. Um, have I got that right? No, I probably got that right, but no, it doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> Lloyd Ross Moyle was the was the previous uh, co-chair of the APPG and, uh, and and when we did the original review, and Lloyd has stayed on to support this work uh, and to see see it through. Um, and they're really grateful for Sarah Staples for the uh, chair of British Youth Council for joining us today. Uh, who's also been part of this process. Um, the APPG for Youth Affairs is ordinarily coordinated by the British Youth Council and by the YMCA England Wales, but they've brilliantly sort of allowed the NYA to take, take the lead around these two areas of work. So um, I know they've, we've, we've got, they've been doing a lot of work around understanding uh, what's been going on, what's changed, and uh, we've got a panel that's going to give us some updates and talk us through some of those changes. So I'll hand over to, I don't know who's taking the lead actually. Thank you for that, Lee. Hi, everyone, and thank you so much for being here today. I think it's so nice to have so many people in a room together, lots of people that we've only seen on Zoom over the past few months. And discovering how tall people are has been such quite an, such an exciting thing today. So I'm going to quickly just give a little bit more information on our two panellists before allowing them both to say a couple words about the report and the process, and then we're going to open straight up the questions. I think that's the way to get the most out of this session. So Joe was elected as the member for Stoke on Trent Central at the 2019 election and before entering national politics he helped a number of businesses and charities across the country working for university enterprise centres as a leadership mentor and for a range of voluntary roles. These have included being a trustee of national and local charities, membership of a town centre management committee, school governor and a small business member on the leadership board for business and environment. And Lloyd was first elected in 2017 for Brighton Kempdown. He's worked at the National Youth Agency, chairing the Woodcraft Bowl, as Vice President of the European Youth Forum, and was previously Vice Chair of the British Youth Council. So I'm going to ask you each to, and I'll be given quite brief over, overviews of yourselves, but Jeff, we come to you first. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, I was absolutely delighted to be uh, able to take over the role of, of chair of the all-party parliamentary group on youth affairs um, because so my, my constituency is Stoke on Trent Central and it was one of those areas that um, I mean quite frankly need, needs a lot of help in, in lots of aspects so the levelling up agenda that, that you're all now terribly familiar with um, to my mind has to include a, a, a big focus on youth, youth skills um, and the pandemic, uh, in a sense, hasn't, hasn't changed that, but it has changed the fact that we, we, we realise how, how vulnerable we are as a society if we don't protect the, the, the generations coming up and um, protect both in the, in, the, in the sense of mental health, uh, safety, uh, skills agenda. And so everything that we, we do in terms of the big projects also has to be reflected in what we do for our young people. Um, I, think, I think it was very helpful to have had a report two years after the initial one to see what the changes were. And in some ways, as I say, you know, it, 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 it's more of the same, but, but actually I would like to suggest that government's understanding of the priorities is maybe better now because we, we all saw um, the, the challenges through school closures, um, through, probably bigger conversations around mental health. 
that, that, that actually, um, if, if we want to protect and grow our economy, we have to look after those people who are, you know, now coming through the system and um, to a certain extent, maybe feel, feel let down, not because of anything that um, could have been avoided because a global pandemic is something that none of us planned for, but it's, it's kind of what was there to, to help during that. So, you know, I'm, I'm a very loud advocate for investment in new services, investment in um, the, the, the skills of Jess, investment in, in the amount of school activities, um, all those things, all, all those, if I can put it this way, add-ons uh, over and above the school curriculum. Also, I mean, we had an interesting meeting just um, last week on, on the APPG, looking at the school curriculum and how relevant it is to young people. Um, looking at also sort of safe spaces in communities, uh, because I think that uh, particularly vulnerable young people need to have places to go where they can learn skills, where they can, can meet friends, where they can be supported. Um, and, you know, I, I echo the call for, for youth workers in that and, and volunteers. One of the big pieces I did early on uh, as an MP was to, to look at uh, volunteering. And I think we all found during the pandemic, a lot of people were able to volunteer, that we've got a furlough and that sort of thing. As we, as we come out of it, it's looking at um, what we do about volunteering, how, how we can, um, as say through the, the, the kind of um, investment in um, youth support workers and, and training of volunteers, we can grow the next generation of volunteers in, in a way that means that this is all sustainable. So I absolutely am delighted to be here today. I welcome the report. Um, I'm 100% I'm, I'm, I'm back. I, don't ask me what, what the spending review contains in detail because I'm a humble backbencher, so I don't know any more than Lloyd knows, I think. Um, but um, I mean, clearly the, the, the government is, is, is aware of the need. And um, you know, if, if we're disappointed, then we just have to keep putting pressure on, I guess, is, is the message. Thank you very much. Well, many of you will know that I was keen when I got into Parliament to focus on this issue, not only because we had seen the decimation of youth services, not quite as much as the decimation of play services, but youth services were probably the next closest to being obliterated in the statutory sector. Um, and actually that, in my view, had really detrimentally harmed the voluntary sector because the voluntary sector had ended up having to pick up the pieces um, that the statutory sector had done, it was distracting them from the work that they were very best at. Um, and I'd seen that as chair at, um, at the Woodcraft Folk, but also um, in my time as at the, um, at the National Youth Agency and um, uh, the, uh, the British Youth Council. And I've seen the difference that a proper coordinated funded system could have and what we had been left with. And some of what I think has happened is, that of course, there were cuts, and let's not re-debate um, re about the, the necessity or not of those cuts. So that's probably a political uh, dis decision that you can take different views on. But what had kind of happened with the sector is that rather than kind of coming together and work out how we could coordinate to make sure that we were resilient against those uh, cuts, the initial response from the sector, I'm afraid, was to kind of almost go for let's just try and save our own little bit and, and, and kind of dog eat dogs almost, you know, divide and rule. I think, I think that's a fair enough assessment to say that's what kind of happened. So I was keen to try and play my part. And, and I think a number of people at that point in 2017 were keen to try and bring people back together in the sector. And, and we've seen that, you know, not only the successful merger of UK youth and, you know, well, that was it took 100 years, I think, for, for, for that merger to, to happen. It was first proposed 100 years before it happened. But actually, you saw some of those things of organisations coming together and saying, we just need to start working together because we can't go on with these cuts because the whole sector will be decimated, not just the statutory sector. And hopefully that's what the report enabled to do. Rather than say what's better, statutory or not, it said, actually, we need to have a coordinated approach it does sound a bit like going back to the future. And my first job was the, was the um, administrator, the secretary of the local strategic partnership for children and youth in, in East Sussex County Council, so, you know, kind of, which was about getting people together, the voluntary sector and the social sector. But you know, let's not just hark back to the past, but it's saying that's what we needed. We needed that as a fundamental building block. 
And then we needed to recognize and value the different roles that each of those have in the sector. We need to have a basic mapping exercise. We need to be able to know that there's quality in the sector. And we need to make sure that fundamentally, every young person has somewhere to go, something to do, and someone to speak to. Now that is an old age adage. Um, and I know uh, whenever we were at youth work conferences, me and Howard Williamson would do the kind of double act where he would kind of talk about uh, his growing up playing football with the kids in, in, in the valleys or whatever. And I would talk about it, 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 um, uh, uh, to policy and, um, and a kind of voluntary youth organization level from the Woodcraft folk. But that was the principle. And I think the report we focused on uh, that. And I think it refocused all governments and oppositions on that move. And I think that's been really positive. But what has come out, I think, of this update is that actually, I think we've moved away from the ask that we want a youth minister now, a singular in one in the education department. What, but what we have said is there needs to be a clear youth minister that maybe is cross-departmental. The government has done that in other departments. I think we've recognised, actually, that it took a long time for DCMS to get up to speed and get their head around what youth were. But now they've got their head around it. There are some interesting synergies around youth and sports, youth and arts, youth and culture. So let's use that. Let's have a cross-cutting ministerial post that sits in education and in culture to bring these things together. And we have that in other areas. That we need to make sure that we focus on that relationship building between young people and youth worker. And we've seen that even more so now in the pandemic, the need for that. And again, I, I, I'm, I'm pleased, um, we'll see the reshuffles always mean that there's a re, slight refocus and rejigging in terms of Secretary of State and everything. But last time I spoke to the Minister, uh, um, previous Minister um, uh, and Secretary of State about this, they were really focused on giving young people in the future an opportunity for an away opportunity out of their community in a different setting. So you make sure you have a residential opportunity for every young person in Britain. Make sure you have regular volunteering opportunities week in, week out for young people in Britain. And that you make sure young people have a relationship with a trusted adult that's not a teacher or a parent. They have got that. The question is now where the money comes from. It is disappointing in the budget that it looks like, I say looks like because none of us, you know, the detail is not always transparent immediately. It takes weeks to pull that. It looks like the overall amount for youth is actually reduced in this budget. Now, I think it's quite right to start to restructure away from just looking at the NCS to look at other areas. Um, but we need to make sure that it's not just focused on buildings. Now, I love what Labour did um, with my space, you know, kind of with, um, with the, the youth club rebuilding programmes. The problem is, when your operational budgets are cut, you end up having beautiful buildings in the middle of cities that have no young people in them, you know, that end up being used as offices for councils. That's not what those buildings were built for. And actually sometimes having a messy, slightly falling down building with really good youth workers and really good provision in is actually better because it doesn't matter if the building gets smashed up a bit, you know, kind of, but what, you know, what you have is really good youth workers, really good youth volunteers that have a building that is theirs, that they have ownership for. Now, I don't want the building falling down in health and safety trap, I'm not saying that, but what I mean is the focus doesn't necessarily need to be building. So we need, I think there's a bit more work that we need to do. And I think the report picks up on some of that. There needs to be more work on building those trusted adult relationships, funding those trusted adults with relationships, but also understanding that some of those trusted adults will be in the voluntary sector, and those voluntary sector adults themselves need support in that relationship. And there's no point in just saying, well, there's some uh, there. And then I would finally say, really interesting piece of work that's out today, of course, I'm sure you'll talk about it later, which is about where those, where those provisions currently are. And that mapping exercise was one of those key things that came out of the report. And now we can start to see the evidence of, in privileged areas, in rich areas, youth provision has remained. In poor areas up and down our country, youth provision has not in the same numbers. So we also need to be more uh, directive in not just saying this needs to be an increase everywhere. We need to uh, we need to um, kind of lift some areas up quicker than others because they are starting from further behind because the cuts have hurt them uh, hurt them more. So a statutory role for youth for local government to play that coordinating role to report and to support 
voluntary youth organisations as well as the structural sector in each area, I think, was a key outcome. And I hope that that structural review will really uh, get there. Thank you. So I'm going to open up now for questions. Um, you can raise your hand if you've got anything to ask. Always a great time. Thank you. It's great right. not to have the first, the tumbleweed of the first question <laughs> session of the day. So, yes. I was relieved to see, obviously, the Education Act and see um, statutory guidance into youth work, um, because a lot of the time, a lot of the things that we're arguing for as youth workers is kind of already there, but it's just a problem that sufficient hasn't kind of been defined. Mm -hmm. So what is it do you reckon that we can actually do as a collective to get the government to define sufficient so that we can actually create tangible steps to move forward? Um. I mean, I think that there's a few ways of looking at sufficiency, and I think we need to look at them in all different ways. So first of all, what is sufficient for the individual young person? And I say that first because I think that's a bit that often gets forgotten. We say, oh, sufficiency is this number of youth workers per this capacity, to, it is in areas, this number of youth clubs. Actually, what is, I think, most important is sufficiency is that every young person, by the time that they stop being a young person, and I deliberately say that in a vague way, because being a young person is a transition period in life, not an age that you put necessarily on it, but we can put some broad age ranges on it. I would put it broadly up to 21 and broadly from about 13, but I'm very broad in that and you can go younger and older. You know? But at that period, in that period in someone's life, they should have had a, a number, not just one, a number of uh, experiences where they are away from home. I think that is key because they have to, that is about being able to move on from living in the family, living in your home. They have to have had, for that whole period, the opportunities to go to weekly activities in some form or another, so that they can build up a strong relationship with an adult. So it's not just about dropping weekly activities, it's weekly activities where that young person can build up a relationship with an adult or not. So yes, a skate park is good, but if it's a skate park that is unmanned or unpersoned, um, that is no good, you know, because it's not building up the relationship that you need. And there needs to be space in their locality, not just a drive away. You shouldn't have to rely on mum and dad to have to drive them half an hour. And that is important in rural areas and semi-rural areas as well, which often get forgotten in this discussion. So for me, sufficiency needs to start at that young person's point of view. That's not quite good enough for a council because a council needs to know, well, then what does that mean in money and numbers figures? So then I think what you do is you start to say, well, broadly, that would look like we can say X amount, that's quite easy for the residential part of that. That's quite easy to quantify. Then you say, well, what is the number of youth workers that are needed per head of population in an area? And that should be a percentage of qualified youth workers, but also voluntary youth workers underneath that, that might not have degree level qualifications, but have training and support throughout that. And that's always been the state actually in the statutory sector as well, even in the statutory sector, they relied on volunteer youth workers and the voluntary sector, of course, which relies on them predominantly. And it's the duty of the council to ensure that those numbers exist. And if they don't, they have to put programmes in to do that. So that's what I think it needs to be defined as, focusing on the young person, but then with some numbers backing it up. And then there needs to be some definition of what happens, um, what, the, what, the, um, what the department's expectation is for councils and local authorities to work towards that. Because I don't think anyone's going to be satisfactory if we, you could set the bar so low that everyone meets it immediately. Well, that I think would be purposeless, you know. Or you set it very high, which is where we want to get to. And then you need a fair and decent roadmap set out by the department of what they expect people to show that they're making sufficient progress. Because I think it's also about goodwill. Have the council made good willing efforts to do that? or have they been um, totally ignoring uh, this area? And so it's also about them saying, well, you need to have um, local participation of young people, you need to have local um, uh, youth uh, boards, it's what we recommended in our report, that then enable to do some of that work of sufficiency. If you've not got that, you can't demonstrate your sufficiency, so therefore you are not sufficient. So those are the basic building blocks that need to be there to achieve the sufficiency. So I would say, um... I, I, I agree with, with a lot of what Lloyd said. Um, the one caveat I would, would, would put in is if you set the bar too high to the extent that it's unachievable, then you may 
end up not having um, less, you know, if 50% if of, of, of what would be the absolute optimum uh, is, is, is good, but not excellent, mm -hmm. is it not better to lay it out as this is what good looks like, rather than this is, you know, this is the kind of gold plated standard that then nobody will achieve it. And, and I know that people um, working in councils and in, in, um, communities where they've got a, a really steep hill to climb will, will struggle even more. So, so I, I absolutely think that there should be a, a, a kind of an individual focus of these are the minimum things that, that every young person should be able to expect. I think then probably there needs to be a bit of work done to work out how much that might cost in terms of, you know, so if, if every young person has to have an experience away from home, are we talking about kind of school trips? And, and if so, um, in some of the, the more deprived communities and councils, if you put if you put a number behind that, and, and would that be funded by the local council via government funding? So, so I think it's it's, it's quite challenging. Um, I would rather go with with the kind of the, the, the personal um, that the young person should ha have certain experiences, have certain contacts, and and work out how to do that, and work out a. Um, a, a, a viable way of delivering each of the statutory guidance, you know, each, each of the, um, the things that you want to include in that. Because none of us want to see yet another piece of statutory guidance that goes nowhere. And you know, if, it, if it's guidance, it's not compulsory. And if it's guidance, you know, there, there are lots of very worthy works in, in the Commons Library that have sat there for decades. and. We'll probably say quite similar things. So, so let's be practical. Let's both aim high but be realistic, so that we can actually deliver on these things. I just say, Joe, Joe's totally right. The, the, the point, though, of statutory guidance is almost as much for the council lawyers as it is for anyone else. At the moment, what happens is when councils are, councils are doing their budgets, council lawyer says, "Well, there's no real guidelines on what's statutory there, so we can cut that to the bone, and you can spend that money how you want." As soon as you put the guidelines in, because there is a statutory duty, even though the guidelines are not statutory, the duty is still um, statutory. Um, then what happens is the council lawyer says, oh, councillor, if you cut that, you could be in breach. Not, we don't know for sure, because it would have to require a court case, but you could be in breach of your statutory duty. And most councillors, all they need is the officer to give them a prompt that you can't do that. And most councillors will immediately then say, okay, well, if that's the case, we'll have to make provision for it. But at the moment, you don't have that check that means the officer, the section, whatever, the finance officer in the council or the, the council lawyer to say, to put a break on when councils are doing difficult decisions with budgeting. And that's, that's the problem that we're at at the moment, isn't it? They have to make difficult decisions. Can I, can I just add one? Because it's very important what, what you said, and I, I absolutely agree. Um, I think there should be a statutory duty on councils to work with the voluntary sector. Yeah. Um, because most councils do, and most councils are good, but, but some councils think, well, we can do youth provision better than anybody else, and so we don't need to engage with anybody else. You know, if there's a limited amount of government funding, we're going to keep it in-house. So I, I, I do believe that there needs to be a, a statutory duty both to consult um, young people and, and the wider sector, but also to invest in a kind of holistic approach to youth services in the, um, the individual areas. Thank you, Joe from the British Youth Council. Um, we really welcomed the APPG's recommendation about having a youth minister across departments, as it's an issue that the British Youth Council and young people have been calling on for, for many years. However, we'd like to see that also wider because youth policy and policy that affects young people is more than just DCMS. It's more than just DFE. Um, you know, if we think about our beautiful new shiny youth clubs that we'll be getting with the capital investment through the Youth Investment Fund, that's no good if young people's last bus goes at 5 p.m. Transport matters. Young people in the secure estate, so the Justice Department matters. Um, so I'd be really keen on the panel's views of how we make sure every government department is taking account of the issues facing young people and how they can involve young people's views in their policy making to make sure that young people really do have an opportunity to level up across the country. 
Yeah, no, I think that that's absolutely, absolutely right. You know, I, I, I do think that, um, that in each department there, there, there is an understanding of, um, of, of challenges for young people, but it's maybe, and, and this is maybe why initially the idea of having a, a young person's minister was, was the way to go, that, that for each department, you know, it's maybe sort of fifth on their agenda or, you know, it's not, it's not high up as the top priority. Um, and because of that, I think may, maybe we need to do some more locking. <laughs> um, you know, it's as simple as that, 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 that maybe just as, you know, the environmental uh, challenges have, have come to the fore in recent years in a way that, that you have to look at the environmental impact of, of policies um, as, as a local council, that, um, that there may be a, should be a requirement that, that everybody has to look at, at the impact on youth of, of, of any policy. So that's something that, that actually could be fairly easily adopted. Um, you know, I do think when, when we talk about youth provision and the funding of youth provision, we, we also have to bear in mind um, that there is lots of funding in lots of different departments that will benefit young people or that, that is aimed at, you know, you, you mentioned the, the um, sports and schools, that sort of thing, um, building football pitches. Um, so it would be quite interesting to do a, an exercise of, of kind of pooling what, what, what is, is allocated in, in, in the budget across different departments, because I, 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 I'm, I'm slightly reluctant to go youth services have been cut um, if it, it's how we define youth services, because if we're defining youth services as um, all the sorts of activities that, that are in the report, so, you know, after school activities, skills development, where there's a budget, say, from um, um, Department for Work and Pensions on, um, you know, I don't know, Kickstart or something, and, and the, the, the skills provision, we, we, we need to recognise that, that that is helping our young people. And in a sense, it would be probably good to, to pull together all the things that help and understand them better, because, you know, I do think that, that, that we need to... Um, so sometimes focus on on the good things that are happening as well as identifying what's missing. I, I agree uh, broadly, yes, uh, with, with everything Joe just said. I, 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 I was at the um, BYC uh, UK Youth Parliament uh, event on the weekend uh, um, in, in, in uh, just next to Grenfell. It was great to meet the young people there. I started off my speech to them, or you know, we did a question time panel, you have two minutes to introduce yourself. I said, I'm greatly worried about society at the moment because I think we've started to introduce socialism into this country. And I said, that's probably a strange thing for a Labour politician to say, but I'm deeply worried that we have a, a stronger form of socialism for older people, but for young people, we're leaving them to a complete free market disaster. We are quite rightly talking about building social frameworks to sort out adult social care, developing stronger. I'm not against that, but the problem is the inequality of developing a social state um, that has strong elements of socialism in for older people at the expense of younger people. And it creates generational divides. It creates schisms. It creates tensions. You look at the housing market. You look at the, you know, kind of the fact that most young people could never uh, aim to really own their home. Um, that you know they can't even aim to get a council house, for example. All these things that the social state that previous generations had have been taken away from them. So I said, I think that's a real problem. And uh, the, the 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 reality is that that is not just the youth department or the education department that's done that. That is housing. That is transport. That is you know kind of jobs and opportunities. That is even the tax system that now means that a young person has very often a higher marginal tax rate. Than, than, than an older person on a same or similar salary. Um, because of those age issues have been introduced, you know, kind of if you think about housing where you can't, you're not eligible for housing benefit until you are 35 for the full amount. You know, these are age related discriminatory policies. Discriminatory policies. And I think there is an argument to start looking at it in that framework. Um, age is a protected characteristic, but when that was put in, it was always thought about it being a protected characteristic for older people being forced out of work, for older people, well, quite right, that those things shouldn't happen. But I actually think there is an argument now to say, 
departments, when they do their impact assessments, when they do their age-related um, uh, impact assessment of policy, need to be showing how it's not discriminatory for young people. And the legislation on equalities was not old people's discrimination, it said age as a protected characteristic. So I just wonder if we need to reframe how we think about that ourselves, but how we think about that in departments as well. And, and, and if you have a cross-departmental cross minister in, uh, probably you'd want them in three departments, you'd want them in the two main departments, and you'd want them in the equalities unit, and their role in the equalities unit, which is a cross-cutting not a department, but a unit within government, is to then go into every area, just like we have a minister that looks and focuses at race inequality or um, women's uh, equality. We need someone who's in that department who's looking at that. I don't think you necessarily need then a minister that's also in housing and also in, I think you need probably women in their main department plus, and that's how the rest of the equalities unit works. You know, kind of the foreign secretary is also the equality secretary. Now, say whether that's good or bad, but that's how it works at the moment. So you would have a youth person in both. That's, I think, Think how I would envisage uh, that, and, and I, and maybe it's a campaign for us to run to say treat young people as a protected characteristic. This is a rights, human rights, equalities issue, and maybe uh, we also get some traction with you know one or two legal cases, and maybe there's a bit of thinking that we collectively need to do on that. Yeah, I'd be very happy. I'd be very interested to hear your thoughts on that. Um, you know, if, if you think that's a good idea, the more people. That, Say it is the more that we can represent those views. Is this coming in on this point? Do that and then we'll take another one. I'm just coming on that point as well then. I think in terms of again the legal stuff, I think it's really important to sort of think about how to en engage with that statutory duty outside of those legal boundaries that a lot of the times do affect the least deprived communities the most because of the constant, again, legal thing that we rely on so much. I think it's important to step outside of that systemic bubble sometimes and think about it more broadly. Yeah, I think, should I ask my question? Yeah, if you ask your question. Yeah. Okay, so my question again is around the, what you spoke around, young people being involved outside their communities and being involved in more voluntary work and more funding to voluntary organizations, which again is important. I think, again, it relates to the relationship between the least deprived and the most deprived communities. A lot of the times you'll also see that young people within the least deprived communities actually do engage outside of the communities while also engaging within their communities at a higher level. And again, and it relates to the point around having more accredited youth workers. There are plenty, I think, of people who do that work of youth work, just not under that name, within the least deprived communities, again, not having that support. So my question is around what can be done around levelling up and also this group more broadly around engaging young people directly into that decision making of where this funding goes and where this money goes, but also the, the people who are often young people providing that youth work service within the least deprived communities. How can they be involved in that decision making as well? Yeah. So, so I think the answer lies within communities. So if I give you an example from uh, Stoke on Trent, which I know, know better than, than any other city at the moment, um, uh, we have a, a thing called the Youth Collective. It's, it's, a, it's a, a collection of, the last count, at least 38 different organisations um, and including the council, two football clubs, you know, that all the people in the city that have an interest in are involved with young people and want to, to come up with solutions. And um, they've basically kind of got together on a completely um, voluntary and you know, unselfish agenda of, of going what what's the answer what you know how how can we shape things that are best and it was what i think going back to, to what we were earlier discussing about how maybe as budgets have been cut in the past people have kind of gone into the into their own organizations and gone well you know we, we must keep going regardless of what's happening out there so i think that the the solution has to be has to be a different solution for each part of the, the country each community probably within within that that country but then um it needs the you know, I say maybe this is a professional facilitation. So maybe that's the role where um, you, you need that, um, that level of, 
involvement from external people too. But then it also needs needs the funding. I mean, you know, quite a lot of things do come down to to, to money in the end. Um, and I think that the reason I like that the kind of community based solutions to things is that um, within communities there are private, public, not for profit sectors all of whom want to contribute because they care about the local community. And so the, the solution then becomes not a, how much do we ask government for, but how can we work together and what do we need of government? And that's a, that's a, that's a much more sustainable um, solution, I think, if, 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 you, if you get it right. Um, well, to me, that is the heart of the recommendation that you need to, in each local area, have a local coordination. So it's not about, you know, there's a, there's statutory sufficiency, but each local area needs to decide how its resources are spent. And in every area of this country, you have areas of multiple deprivation and areas of wealth. You know, I think Brighton is an example, you know, kind of Caroline Lucas's constituency is in the top 10 wealthiest constituencies in the country. And my constituency is in the bottom 10% of uh, poorest uh, constituencies in the country and we are next to each other there's one road Lewis Road that divides the two mainly about where all the council estates were built you know kind of on the edge of the city and that's where Hamilton. but every community every community will have that you know kind of it's not just you know you know I said I was in Kensington and Chelsea uh, this this weekend that community is exactly the same you know kind of in the sense of wealth cheek to jowl so it's also about in communities coming together and coordinating where the wealth and resources are so that you can make sure that it is directed to the right people. But in that committee, in that grouping, in that coordination, it can't be just councillors. It must be young people. It must be community representatives themselves, the people who are working on the ground. In fact, my view is that the councillors should have a minority stake in that. The majority should be made up of the other actors. The councillors there to some extent, and the council officers, let's just use that as a kind of general term for the authorities should be there partly to be listening and hearing that feedback. There is a wider discussion, I guess, about how you, um, how democracy works. I think in rural areas, actually, you have a much better basis of doing some of that with the parish council structure. I think it's a great shame that we don't have parish councils in urban areas more. Um, now that's a kind of, we're veering off youth work areas now, but I think where you have parish councils, and where you have, or neighborhood councils, or you know, kind of whatever terms more, what you can have is more focus on the local need and the local issue. Because in most of those councils, there are non party political representatives, some of them party political, but usually a lot, most parish councils are non party political. And what they are is they are local people in that community coming together. They have the ability to raise a little bit of tax, they have the ability to spend a little bit in local areas. And I think, for example, in Peacehaven, in my constituency, the last election, the two parish councils of Telscombe and Peacehaven said youth work was their top priority. They were going to increase the council precept for everyone that lived there. And they won the, the, some of the independent, I mean, it's no, no one party controls it, but the independents and Labour, and two, they all said that's what they wanted to do. And they did it and they won on, on that basis. And they've now opened the youth club for two more days a week. Now, two more days a week doesn't seem much, but it's better than, you know, kind of than, than the one day it was a week before or whatever. So there are things there that can be done. And that's how I think that this report basis is that kind of um, community needs to be the starting point. Unfortunately, we don't have any more time for questions from the floor, but one last quick question for both of you which is what are the next steps that you will be taking to champion young people and youth work in Parliament? I think we've had some interesting suggestions come out of the discussion today. Um, I, I, I do like the one, I don't think it was Lloyd, it was a point audience I can't quite remember, about um, the um, uh, generational bias. And I mean, I know you talked about it and, and, and actually looking at how policies affect young people, that, that, that could be something to take up with the Equalities Minister um, as, a, as a very specific focus, because that unlocks an awful lot of other conversations around um, are we getting it right in, in all the various different departments. So that was kind of my big, big takeaway. Um, but um, a, a lot of food for thought, so thank you very much. Well, we're going to still work. I mean, I'll continue to support Joe on the APPG, and we're going to continue 
we've got an interesting and exciting program uh, on, on that coming forward. I do think we probably need to have another debate on this. Last time we asked the government for debate in their time and they gave it to us. And so I think it might well be worth going back. And if they don't want to, we do it through the backbench a business committee to have a debate where we see where we move these issues on. So I'm, I'm happy to kind of do that. And, and you know that with me, uh, you've got a, a, an ally in a kind of, you made me, so I now have to give back most of my time to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you both for joining us today. Day. I know it's a busy week in Westminster, and thank everyone for your questions. Thank you.